you all for coming along on a Friday night when you could be doing other things. Uh, congratulations to Kirky SNP for putting together a full house of politicians this evening. You've got a councillor, your local representative, your MSP, your local representative, your Westminster MP, your local representative, your MEP as well. Of course, the collective noun of politicians is a confusion of politicians. Uh, and I think that pretty well suits where we all are when we talk about Brexit and think about what's going on at the moment. Now, I'll say from the outset, how people voted in 2014, yes or no, is the past. How people voted in the EU referendum, leave or remain, is also in the past. It's the great uh, joke, uh, there was a, a, a tourist, an American tourist lost in Ireland, and he said to one of the locals, hey Barry, how would I get to Tipperary? And the, local, the, the Irish boy says, oh, by Jesus, if you were going to Tipperary, I wouldn't start out from here. That's how I feel about where political Scotland is right now. None of us asked for this, none of us wanted this, not least in the SNP. But we're serious, and we're at our posts, and we have a challenge to save what's best about Scotland's best future in whatever the challenges are. Now, as Rhoda rightly said, 62 within the EU, significantly across every single local authority within Scotland. Unanimous. Now, of course, that means that 38% of the electorate in that referendum voted to leave. And I do not take that for granted. There are a number of people who voted leave and expect something to happen, and something will happen, that we do know. I don't want to see a referendum rolled back, or unpicked, or challenged in the courts, or overturned by judges, elected or otherwise, foreign or otherwise, because I think that sets a poor precedent for the independence referendum that may or may not be on the horizon. But we do have a challenge. And what we did see, compare the two referendums. In the Scottish referendum in 2014 on independence, our values are, in the SNP and indeed I believe in Scotland, that if you live in Scotland, you're Scottish. If you're here, you're one of us. If you're here, you're part of our community now, and you're part of our community going forward. We put that into action. EU nationals resident in Scotland had a vote on Scotland's independence. That was noticed across the European Union. In the UK referendum, we had a vote that was based on the franchise for the Westminster election. EU nationals were excluded. 2.6 million people resident within these islands who made the UK their home were told, we're going to have a referendum, we're going to have a discussion about your rights, about your rights to be here, about our place in the world, but you won't have a vote because you're not one of us, eh? It was gratuitously hurtful to a number of people who have paid us the supreme compliment of making Scotland their home. So if you take nothing else away from tonight, there are people who are feeling anxious right now in Scotland. Reach out to them and say you're welcome. I was never more proud to be an SNP politician than when our leader Nicola Sturgeon, in the aftermath, as Rona says, of the, the, the Brexit vote, stepped out of Butte House and prioritised the rights of EU nationals, saying you're here, you're welcome, and Scotland will keep you safe. Because that's the sort of country I want to be part of. We have seen, regrettably, a number of really poor outbreaks of xenophobia within these islands. I don't think Scotland's immune from that. We cannot be complacent about where we are. We cannot take anything for granted. We are going to need to circle the wagons and remember to keep each other safe and keep each other secure because there's some real challenges in this. And the numbers are pretty stark. Within the UK, 2.6 million EU nationals. Across the EU, 2.2 million UK nationals. The emails I'm getting on a daily, almost hourly basis would break your heart. People who've made their home in Scotland or made their home in France or Spain or Cyprus or wherever else now feeling really worried about what's going on. And never has so much been thrown into the air for so little. <clears throat> Contrast again the independence referendum in 2014. We produced the white paper. We put forward our proposition. We put forward our proposition that could be tested. And some people were persuaded, some people were not, and that's democracy. And we accept that result, absolutely. But we put forward our proposition to be tested and debated about. Within the EU referendum, there was zero proposition from a Leave campaign that lied and lied and lied and lied. Now, I respect any individual's individual vote. I do not respect the Leave campaign. Because I've been an MEP for 13 years, and I've got used to, almost inured to, the misrepresentation, the willful ignorance, the deliberate falsehoods that usually accompany the EU debate, but this was something else. 
This was taking <laughs> willful misleading of the public, decent, thoughtful, hard-working people, to a quantum level. And what the Leave campaign did, and we now see it's very clear, uh, there's an interview in this week's, uh, it, it's the New Statesman, I believe, not a usual publication I read, I have to say, but uh, it is the New Statesman. There's a flag in the front of it as well, lovely. Uh, this is Aaron Banks, the headline being, The Man Who Brought Brexit. And they're quite open about it, and history books will be written about the Leave campaign. They deliberately targeted the people in all our society who are angry. And I'm angry. I'm angry at the fact that we've not jailed bankers in this country. I'm angry at the fact that we're tolerating industrial scale tax evasion. I'm angry that we're not concentrating on climate change and kicking on the economy and solving the refugee crisis, working with our friends and our colleagues across the, the world where we're seeing countless millions of people in the Middle East uh, up in sticks and, and coming towards us for help and for support and for sanctuary and being turned away by razor wire in the 21st century. No, damn right I'm angry. I don't think if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. But what the Leave campaign did was to tap into that anger and say, you're right, blame the EU, blame the immigrants, blame the foreigners. The sort of stuff that's been happening since the 13th century. Blame the Jews, blame the Poles, blame whoever else, blame somebody else. It was the basis in human nature, and it took us to a bad place. And sadly, I suspect it's not over yet, because by a narrow majority across the UK, they won, 52%. And I think we're seeing societal implications in terms of people feeling insecure. We're seeing a breakdown of generational solidarity as well, because there is a clear age split in terms of who voted to remain and who voted to leave. And we're seeing the consequences that are only going to affect us once it happens properly. If you take nothing else away again, it's remember Brexit hasn't even begun to start yet. Everything that we've seen in terms of the, the, the fluctuation of the sterling currency, the ins economic insecurity that we're seeing, people feeling unsure about it, nothing's changed yet. It's going to. So what we're seeing is the prelude to what's going to happen. We are going to have a number of challenges within this. Now, without Scotland, we did have a different campaign. Uh, we in the SNP, we produced the We Blue book, remember this? Uh, we got out and about to tell people how the EU works, good, bad and indifferent. And I want my country, I'm proudly an SNP politician, I want my country to be independent, but I want that independent country to work with other countries to beat the challenges facing us as a species. Be it climate change, be it the refugee crisis, be it organised crime, all of these are bigger than any one country, be that 5.5 million people in Scotland, be that 65 million people in the UK, acting as 500 million people, maybe we're in with a shout of getting something done. I want to see my country working multilaterally, respecting international law, being part of the family of the international community, not walking away from it and pretending we're somehow different from everybody else. And we have, as I say, a challenge facing us on that. And our position within this debate is that we start about what's best for Scotland. And this is my point about leave voters, remain voters, we're all where we are right now together and we're going to need to work together to salvage what's best for Scotland. And we're starting with values. First off, we want to preserve freedom of movement. We want to preserve the rights of people to come and live, work, study, travel in Scotland, set up businesses here, marry into our communities, raise their bairns here, pay their taxes here. Immigration has been great for Scotland, in every sense. Enriched us as a society and enriched us as an economy as well. We also want to keep the rights that we as Scots have to travel, live, work, study elsewhere across the European continent. Because that has also enriched us as a society. We don't want to lose those rights either. We want to maintain membership of the single market. And the single market is where... Uh, you no more export from Kirkintilloch to Glasgow than you do from Scotland to Cyprus because the single market keeps the rules the same. That creates the best part of 300,000 real jobs in the real economy in Scotland, all of them at risk. Now yes, of course, for Scots, we went through the 2015-14 uh, referendum. That's why I'm not on the Budgets Committee. The, the 2014 referendum where we explored the Norway option, we explored the Iceland option, of course, other ways of interacting with the EU are possible. So why didn't the Leave campaign tell us what they might be? Why is it only now we're hearing about the difference between a soft Brexit and a hard Brexit, or even more gruesome one, a smooth Brexit or an ugly Brexit? I find them all pretty ugly, I have to say. 
Where was that scrutiny during the campaign? A number of people are thinking really hard about how best to preserve Scotland's best interest. So the First Minister, as well as setting out uh, what our values are within this discussion, has established the Standing Council on Europe. Uh, I'm privileged to be a member of that. That's a number of people with real expertise within Europe. We've got uh, David Edwards, uh, the former UK judge of the European Court of Justice. We've got uh, various other folks who've got real expertise within this area. And our job is to come up with options. Now I'm talking about status within the EU, not necessarily membership, because membership is a very defined legal set of rules and norms. Status could mean other things. Uh, within the EU, we've already found upwards of 30 places that have different status vis-a-vis -vis the EU and their member state. It's the Faroe Islands, it's uh, the Holland Islands, it's French Polynesia, it's Guadeloupe, so I've got some cracking fact-finding missions out of it, if nothing else. <laughs> there are other ways of interacting with the EU. Variable geometry, as it's called, within Brussels. We already accept variable geometry within the UK in that the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man have different status vis-a-vis -vis the UK and vis-a-vis -vis the EU. I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility with political goodwill and good sense, both of which are in short supply presently, but it's not out with the realms of possibility that we could see something like England and Wales, which did vote to leave, move to an Isle of Man sort of status, and Scotland, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar, which voted convincingly to remain, remain more or less where we are, legally. That's the sort of discussion that we're having right now with Brussels. And it's not going to be pretty and it's not going to be elegant. But our starting point and our ending point is what is in Scotland's best interests and how do we secure those interests. So I believe there are ways of doing that. Prime Minister May knows that she, her hand on this is not strong. She knows she's got a divided party. She knows she's got a very narrow majority in the Brexit vote. She knows that there's no preparation and no planning. A shocking dereliction of duty on the part of David Cameron. If you're going to have a referendum with massive economic, societal and constitutional consequences and you only prepare for one outcome, I'd have them in the jail, <laughs> I must confess. The idea that there was no pre preparation for this at all out with the Bank of England with a, 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 a part of a contingency plan and the Scottish Government because we spotted things going the wrong way a wee bit earlier, is a shocking state of affairs for a developed nation, however we define de developed nation in these, in, in these islands in these times. So we have a number of things to be working upon. We'll be bringing forward the paper on options around about December as we see things moving forward. As Stuart rightly said, uh, we've seen the English High Court ruling uh, upon uh, the, the Brexit challenge as to whether or not Parliament, the UK Parliament, should have a vote in terms of the activation of Article 50. Article 50 within the Lisbon Treaty was drafted uh, by one of my predecessors, Professor Neil McCormack, uh, who was on the Constitutional Convention, chaired by former French President Giscard d'Estaing, and it was Giuliano Amato, the, the former Italian Prime Minister, who actually drafted Article 50, and he said, and I won't do the accent because that, that would be flippant, but he said, it, it, it's, it, it's like a fire extinguisher, you never really want to use it. And I said, well, I, I, want a, I, want a fire, I don't want to use a fire extinguisher, but I want it to work if I do. <laughs> Article 50 was drafted as I will have that there and will never actually use it seriously. If it was going to be seriously used, it would have been a lot more detailed and a lot more clear. There is no clarity in Article 50 worth the name. I'm a lawyer to trade myself. I could drive a coach and horses through every line of it. But as far as we know, the best legal interpretation is that once Article 50 is triggered, however it is triggered, and that may be by lodging a letter with the European Commission, it may be verbally in person at the Council of Ministers. There may be other ways of triggering it. There's a two-year process which deals with the getting out of the EU. Now, there's actually, Article 50 being as poorly drafted as it is, five interlocking sets of negotiations. Because leaving the EU is actually quite straightforward. It's all the rights and privileges that apply at the moment cease to apply on this date. The question for all of us is what comes next. Are we seriously going to need to apply for visas to get to France? Logically, I don't think we are. But we're going to need to have some sort of arrangement with the government of France to make sure that we don't, and that will need to be reciprocal. So it's what comes next is going to be the challenge. We're also going to have the negotiations of the UK contribution to the EU budget, which has been agreed and has been signed up until 2020. I've been doing a lot of work with the third sector around here as well. There's a number of third sector organisations really worried about the financial implications of Brexit on their bottom line right now. So there are a lot of things to be kept safe, a lot of things that we're going to need to be working upon. But I'd reiterate the promise that I made at the, the, the start of my, my speech that we're on it. 
We're working as a team, we're working together, we're working up and down the parliaments, up and down the local authorities, up and down the other parties as well. And we're going to need to work with all the people of Scotland, yes or no, leave or remain, we are all facing a common challenge. And this tide is going to hit all of our boats. So if anybody's got any bright ideas or any bright questions, I'm all ears. I'm keeping up the resource that we have uh, after the, the weekly book. It's www.scotlandineurope.eu. We're keeping that updated with information as it's coming forward. I'm producing every Friday afternoon a Scotland in Europe update. Do get onto my website, alansmith.eu, to register for that. I have to say there's not many jokes in it, but it will keep you up to date with what's going on. So it's up to us to get the information to you, and it's up to us to serve the best interests of the people of Scotland, and I promise you that we will continue to do that. So I look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks very much. Okay, I've got four questions um, already, uh, which I'm planning.